It's time for Mac Break Weekly. We've got a great show for you. Renee Ritchie has a day off, but Dave Hamilton from the Mac Observer is with us. Of course, Lori Gillen, Andy Anako as well. Apple takes to Capitol Hill. We'll talk about the testimony going on right now. A second Zoom vulnerability and a second fix from Apple. And why is the 2019 MacBook Air just a little bit slower than last year's? It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 607, recorded Tuesday, July 16th, 2019. Is that a camera in your pocket? Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Epson's EcoTank Printers. Kiss expensive cartridges goodbye. Add an Epson EcoTank printer to your home or office. EcoTank comes with a ridiculous amount of ink. Just fill and chill. Check out Epson.com slash EcoTankLeo to learn more. And by LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Just remember your master password, and LastPass remembers the rest. Visit LastPass.com slash twit to learn more. And by Captera. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Captera is software selection simplified. Visit Captera's free website at captera.com slash MacBreak. It's time for MacBreak Weekly, the show where we cover the latest Apple news. And we are going to have a fun day today. Renee Ritchie is on assignment. Yeah, you know what that means. <laughs> He's getting briefed by Apple about something. I feel like something's going on only because Apple closed the... Uh, the um, App Store yesterday, the uh, the uh, not the App Store, the Mac Store where you buy Apple gear yesterday, and then you know yes, we're we're down. We'll be back up for some <laughs> big changes. We'll be up sharp, and then nothing happened. But I feel like something's in the works. Anyway, we'll find out. In in Renee's place, we've got the great Dave the Nerd, Dave Hamilton from Mac Observer. Hello, Dave. Hey, Leo. Thanks for having me. In I your am, studio, uh, happily here. Yeah, in my studio. That's right. I'll go play the drums later. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> you have a huge variety of percussive devices behind you. Oh, you aren't seeing half of them. Yep. It's, <laughs> it, it's an addiction, but that's okay. I do this tech thing to fuel that. So How long go. have you been doing Mac Observer? We just celebrated our 20th year wow. in business, believe it or not. Yeah. Wow. I know. And we've been doing Mac Geek Gab, our weekly podcast, uh, for over 14 years now. So, yeah, it's crazy. You, I know. Uh, we're getting old. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, you know, we're still doing it. So yeah. I think that's it's better than the alternative. You don't look older. That's the thing that bugs me. But OK, I'm OK with it. You okay. know, I was using that 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 face app or whatever it was that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, wasn't that funny? Show. Yeah, I had it had been decades since I had seen the spitting image of my grandfather and I put it in old mode and I like I had a teary moment. That it was, I, I looked exactly <laughs> like him in that app. Aww. So it, if I get old, that's okay, right? Like yeah. it's, he was one of my favorite people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, I, look, um, I looked like Freddy Krueger, so I didn't really have that moment <laughs> right. at all. Yeah, you had a different moment. I saw it. Yeah, it was. We were, it was a we were very having different unpleasant, experiences together. <laughs> unpleasant experience. <laughs> uh, also with us, Andy Anako, once again in the Boston Public Library, uh, where he lives. There's a little tiny <laughs> Anako over your. Don't look now, but there's a little tiny Anako over your left shoulder. Uh, it'll be it'll be okay. I'm sure he's not That's there okay. to take over or anything. So you know, so so actually, if we can just tag in and tag out, that would help me a lot. <laughs> I got I got I got a whole bunch of deadlines this week. No no boats in a bottle though behind you today. Uh, well, now I'm facing the other way. Uh, because now, because now I have like a, my actual like lighting setup here, oh, it and looks I was good. thinking, well, maybe maybe I could like open the open the the, uh, the 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 curtains, and you could see like the beautiful lake with the terns and the ducks behind me. But it's still a little bit too. Maybe when it's rainy outside, we'll do that. And from the punk rock post punk band Sickburn, I give you lead singer Lori <laughs> Gill. She also happens to be managing Hi. editor of iMore. And it looks like you're in a radio station today. You've got albums and a turntable and a Wolfman Jack behind you. And or no, I'm sorry, that's not Wolfman Jack. That's uh, Little Richard. I'm talking about Little Little Richard's uh, yeah, over your Little shoulder. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> Hi, Lori. Yep. Do you want to see what I'll look like when I'm old? Do you want to just see that? Yeah, is, I do. This is terrifying. <laughs> I don't know. You have to zoom in on that, Karsten, to really, <laughs> really get the full effect. Oh wow! This is what happens that's if you amazing. use Face App and you're already old. You get even <laughs> older. 
I'm going to send that to my mom. Say, what happened? It's like one of those apples. <laughs> I look like an apple doll. Yeah, one of those dried <laughs> apple dolls. Ay, ay, well, Dave, ay. if you if if like you said, you really do look exactly <laughs> like your grandfather. Have you considered like exploiting this to like sort of falsify a more colorful history for your grandfather? <laughs> like you can just like I, you know, Mike. My grandfather's got a pretty colorful history as it is. He's the one that invented those uh, oval-shaped binocular viewing machines that you kind of see all over the country. <laughs> so I'm not sure I wait, could wait. improve upon this. You mean the things you put a okay, quarter into so you could see Mount Rushmore up close? Wait, 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 wait. Exactly. So he, he owes me at least seven quarters. <laughs> got, you see, you, you, this is not justice delayed. This is only justice deferred. Okay, I, I was with my right. family at the Pilgrim ship in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts, and I only had like one dollar in quarters, put two of them in, two of them got eaten and who didn't get ice cream that day who didn't get a get a hoodsy cup Me, i was briefly uh, briefly a little nervous that you were going to say was the first treasure of the united states dave <laughs> uh yeah no thankfully no. Fe no. featured yeah, on the what is it the what bill is hamilton on i don't $10 know bill. ten dollar uh, bill the ten yeah the ten i should know because yeah. it's and, in the and song thanks to lin manuel miranda it's still on the ten it was going to be replaced really he, <laughs> wow yeah he let it charge i don't know four or five years ago or something when when the show hamilton was having its peak yeah he uh you can't he, take he that preserved off. the family yeah. name that's right yep uh let's see uh let's take a look at the big board of apple news <laughs> <laughs> board being operative right now uh apple's testifying i believe along with facebook and google uh, at the uh, in front of Congress, right? The big the big tech companies are. Te I can't pull it up because my subs I can't log in my subscription <laughs> uh, to the Washington Post. I can't log in. They're testifying. There you go. That CNET. That's a good choice. I can log into them. They're testifying in front of the uh, House Judiciary Committee. Uh, basically, it's about antitrust, right? And the Facebook Libra yeah. currency and. So the hearings have titles like Online Platforms and Market Power, Part 2, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, yeah, this this is part of a year and a half long series of uh, of of these kind of panels that that have been announced. Uh, the first one was about three or four weeks ago to take a look at every single aspect of the tech industry to see if there needs re more regulation or if there is uh, antitrust violations going on. Uh, and it is bipartisan and for it's not. Uh, well, it, this is an issue that kind of uh, affects voter, uh, inspires voters on both sides of the aisle. But this isn't just one instance of, okay, they're calling these people out for a press conference. We are, I'm sure, going to see some pretty serious change over the next couple of years. Because, again, this is an emphatic and consistent policy. Uh, we are going to examine every aspect of tech industries, particularly the ones that have become uh, companies that become so huge that they have become almost political fiefdoms in and of themselves and decide if all the decisions that we made in 1990 on loose regulation need to be tightened up a little bit. So, Lori, why Apple? <laughs> I would say, of all, I mean, Google, <laughs> Amazon, Facebook, yeah, but Apple's not dominant. They, uh, they're they a small market share. Are they Are they well, a monopoly? They, I, yeah, I think you can put them into that category in, in part because of the, the ecosystem that Apple has. Um, where everything is what I think we've heard the term the walled garden and Apple sort of dominates all of its own stuff. So um, the App Store, for example, the iTunes. I guess um, you could say the, the App Store is a monopoly device. in the Apple ecosystem. Right. But the so Apple, the you know, idea. iPhone is at best a 50 percent market share in the U.S., right? And much smaller worldwide. Mac OS is 5 percent uh I mean, it's not like they are a dominant player in the technology sphere. Right. But Except I that think they... the reason they're being um, kind of called out in this particular situation is just that uh, is, is, is specifically that they're dominating their own ecosystem. And I think the reason they're being lumped in with all of these other companies that are significantly larger than them is there have been a lot of complaints of people um, at, you know, app developers even saying, you know, you're making it really difficult for us to participate in your right. in your playing field. And so it, the the general sentiment, I think, is different. But I can see how the the government not not knowing the details would would lump Apple into that. Apple may not be as big as the other companies, but they're certainly talked about as much or more than the other companies. Dave. 
Yeah, well, that's just it, right? They are the one of the most popular companies on the planet, one of the most valuable companies, and that makes them one of the most powerful companies on the planet. So I think it's if we don't include them in these talks, what will people say about our decisions to yeah. target Google, Facebook, and not Apple, right? So I, I think they have well, to be there. I think there's there a risk, though. That, uh, there's a risk. You don't want to look like you're punishing a company for being successful. And so if you lump Apple in because merely because it's the most valuable company in the in the world historically actually it's not right now microsoft is i don't notice is microsoft on these hearings i don't see them you could argue microsoft has a, a much larger percentage of operating system business they have a monopoly in operating systems um i don't know uh, who but, so okay but I think I think largely the antitrust action against Apple is due to how they operate the App Store, particularly how they have they for they have competitors in video, they have competitors in music, and those competitors, if they want to operate within the Apple ecosystem, have to suffer uh, uh, financial penalties that Apple itself does not have to suffer. Uh, and then of course there's the closed system of, uh, of of iPhone development that you can't simply you have to always obey Apple's rules, uh, and sometimes that's for the good of consumers, and sometimes arguably that's for the good of Apple. So uh, I, I think the stakes aren't quite as high for Apple as they are for Facebook and Google, uh, particularly how those two companies have been operating the advertising business. But that's, they're not just there because they're making too much money and they have to be part of this uh, collection. Elizabeth Warren, who, by the way, uh, initially called, remember she was the first as a presidential candidate in 2020, called for the breakup of Google uh, yes. and the breakup of Facebook. Uh, then later, the next day, she was asked, well, Apple II? And she said, it felt like almost, oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> Apple II. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> today, she said, today's big tech companies have too much power over our economy, our society, and democracy. But actually, uh, she said that when she talked about breaking up in March. Ted Cruz uh, said, by almost any measure, the giant tech companies are larger and more powerful than Standard Oil was when it was broken up. They're larger and more powerful than AT&T when it was broken up. And yet, I have to point out, AT&T was one company. Standard Oil was one company. If you say, in aggregate, the tech sector has too much power, that's a very different thing. That's not the same thing as saying one company has too much power. I, and I, I really don't think Apple's a monopoly in any sense of the word. So this is kind of almost a new way of thinking of what, what, what antitrust means. And mm -hmm. I think you've got to be very careful because... Uh, you can't look like you're punishing the tech sector because it was successful or you're punishing Apple because it's valuable or worse, you're punishing Apple because they stood up to the FBI when they wanted them to unlock that mm. iPhone. That would be an even mm. worse optically. Well, uh, again, this is a bipartisan panel uh, in every sense of the word. Uh, yeah, when you get Elizabeth the Warren and Ted Cruz and sit next to each other. Yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, kowtowing to the FBI is not necessarily a Democratic uh, <laughs> imperative at this point. Yet, I have to uh, point do, out and, Ted Cruz oh, also, is there because also, of bias against conservatives. He's not there because of privacy violations. Yeah. He's there because he well, says Twitter and Facebook are biased against our, our political party, which is not yeah, apparently this is, well, true. This, well, this is going to be part of the conversations moving forward. Uh, again, these these panels are supposed to be mostly antitrust. There are going to be other more partisan actions against Google and Twitter and Facebook uh, against the perceived uh, against the perceived uh, 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 attempt to silence conservative voices. This is another issue where there is huge bipartisan support, but for both for but for opposite reasons. Uh, Google, uh, excuse me, uh, the uh, conservatives want to get after uh, Facebook and Twitter and Google because they are it's, they can they believe that uh, conservative voices are being censored and silenced. Uh, uh, liberal and the side of the, of the fence wants to go after them because they feel as though they're not doing enough to to tamp down uh, uh, white supremacist speech and hate speech and all that other sort of stuff. Yeah, well, that's just pointing uh, th out these are, this has nothing to do with antitrust for at least some of them. The other thing is traditionally antitrust is about unfair price competition, right? That's what um, in the United States we look at is pricing that hurts consumers. And the problem you have is Google's giving away services, most of its services for free. Facebook's giving away all of its yep. services for free. So what, what's the pricing that's hurting consumers? So what this is all going to require, I think, is a region. I don't know if really what we should be talking is antitrust here. Maybe privacy yeah. concerns. That's yeah. legitimate, Lori. Well, I think the privacy concerns is a completely different conversation that has been had and should be continued to be had 
in this particular case, though, a <clears throat> hundred million years ago when I was still in college um, and the Internet was just just starting, I remember having discussions about how the, right now at the time, um, the Internet is this sort of wild west. It's it's the beginning of radio. It's the beginning of television. There's no regulations at the time that there was nothing. So we are now today looking at what that looks like when we've had this sort of open entertainment and media source that hasn't been regulated yet. And now we, it, it's grown to the point where it needs some kind of some kind of checks and balances. And and it's it's so big. It got so big that I, I can imagine that. Like, where do you start? You do you call it antitrust? Do you create brand new laws, which I think is probably the best thing to do, but might be the most difficult to do. Brand new laws for tech because the the same the same sort of standards don't apply and shouldn't apply to um, technology. It's it's to me this is this is a long time coming, and I'm surprised that it hasn't happened sooner. Yeah, I'm surprised. Well, you say that Google Go gives ahead. things away for free, right? But it the price is privacy. To your point, Lori, that this is huge, right? Because Google's taking your information. Yes, they're they're trading you their services and harvesting your information. Facebook's doing the same thing. Apple's taking a different approach. So I, I think there is, you know, the Federal Trade Commission should be looking deeper than just the, the direct monetary relationship between consumer and, uh, and Google and consumer and Facebook. You've got to look at the whole picture and where that money's actually being made and why. And, and to well, your point, Laurie, like hopefully new laws get made that, that help regulate some of this stuff. Yeah, well, it's it's a it's a wide map, and antitrust is just part of this. And not only are they looking at uh, how is this affecting consumer prices, but it's also they're also looking at how does this affect markets. Uh, the first big hearing uh, a few weeks ago was uh, part of it was the, a coalition of like local news producers, like local newspapers and such, essentially saying that uh, they don't have the ability to really negotiate against uh, against Google and Facebook for uh, the amount of money that they uh, they get from ads they wanted to get a sort of they wanted to get sort of a waiver so they could provide so they could create sort of a collective negotiation group so they could create a trust of their own so that they can uh, demand better more favorable positions and rates from uh, google and facebook so this is not just going to be about the question uh well how does this affect uh, how much money uh, people uh, consumers have to pay for ads going to affect if a group of developers, if a group of, 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 of service providers want to get together and say, here is how Apple's policies are limiting what we can do for our customers and the products that we can do and produce. Uh, and uh, why and why is Apple allowed to uh, bend these rules for their own interests, but we can't bend them for our interests? That sort of thing is going to come up. Now, the need for more regulation is also going to be uh, very, very important, but it's but it is a separate issue. Uh, and it's not one that I uh, I, I, I like Liz, uh, Elizabeth Warren for so many reasons. I don't necessarily agree with the. If you're a big, big, big company, that means that you. It is the. It is in consumers' best interest that you be broken up into smaller companies, because uh, if you think uh, if you think about Google as, as as we often say, as I often say, it really is a transaction. Either you're okay with the transaction that happens when you use Google Maps, Google Search, uh, Google Docs, all these other uh, Google apps and services, then great, go ahead and do it. If you don't, then you should not uh, be participating in this sort of stuff. But the fact of the matter is, if they do break up Google, uh, the fact is that all these really wonderful services that Google makes no money off of and doesn't really get as much content from as you might think, if these were to all disappear uh, because it's all being funded by Google Ads and now Google Ads is going to be a totally separate company that can't necessarily prop up all of these free products, uh, you it's hard to really look at how much good has been done by the virtue of the fact that there is this thing called Google Maps out there. And when you want to, every, I, I, use, uh, I use Google research all the time where I just want to, I need to become less dumb on a topic that I know nothing about. And I don't want to just look for like BuzzFeed articles about it. I need to get to like original academic research on it. You can go to a, a Google search page that is only for academic papers and has no ads on it whatsoever. That's, that's those are the sort of things that tend to go away. So that's why it's just, it's a complicated issue. It's not as simple as, but Google is huge and 
powerful. Facebook is huge and powerful. Apple is huge and powerful. They need to break up their hardware and their software and their operating systems uh, and their services businesses into separate units that can't uh, interact with each other. I think that is in the long run worse for consumers uh, than it would be uh, better for industries. Well, I agree. It's complicated. I doubt very much Congress has effect. Philip Elmer DeWitt, when he writes about it, says, I wonder who on the committee can tell the difference between Apple, Google, Facebook, yeah. and Amazon? If, uh, <laughs> the, the, the good news is that when Elizabeth Warren proposed, like breaking, said, we must break up Google, that wasn't done from his her Senate account. This was done from her campaign account. Yeah, it's a campaign so this is, measure. And so, it, it's good. It's grandstanding. Uh, and I'm sure there's grandstanding going on right now. Uh, in the uh, meeting in the meeting room, but uh, I can't wait. I can't wait for the the time when the people that sit on these panels actually understand technology yeah. and ask the right questions yeah. and actually are able to understand the answers. And when the answers don't make sense, they can actually say, "Wait a minute, you didn't answer my question. Answer my question." Because right yeah, we're now getting it's close. We're getting I, close. I watch yeah, these things. Yeah. And it's, that, that, that's. That's really, uh, I, I think that's really interesting because when uh, we went all through all this in the 90s, we were dealing with uh, legislators and legislative aides who did not grow up with the internet, so they had no idea what they were regulating. Right now, though, we have plenty and plenty of people in Congress who did grow up with the internet, and they have assistants who grew up with the internet and maybe even grew up with uh, with mobile wife with a uh, uh, mobile internet. So uh, even if uh, specific congressmen are not as on the ball, they're being advised by people who are more on the ball and hopefully understand how bad gutting something like Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act would be. Uh, so I, my hopes are higher than they would normally be when I hear that, oh, thank goodness, Congress is considering regulating technology. Yay. I feel, I feel like there's been a little schooling, too, from the public and that you can't you can't just slide on this thing yep. uh, as much as you, you might have. It's very, look, no, everyone understands. It's very complicated and it's subtle in a way. And I don't know if Congress... Uh, or or the laws are sufficiently sophisticated to uh, to solve, um, but these hearings seem to advance nothing. Uh, but I guess it's a start. We're going to take a break. When we come back, uh, there is Mac news. There is Apple news. There's lots to talk about. Uh, but first, a word from our sponsor, Dave. Before the show, we were talking about dongles, and I I averred that I think the time will soon come when we don't uh, we don't see Type A USB anymore and you said, yeah, but what about printers? I use a wireless printer, and I don't, I don't, I bet there's a USB connection on there. I don't know. I use an Epson EcoTank printer. They are fabulous, all-in-one wireless printers. But my favorite feature of the Epson EcoTank printers is you can kiss expensive cartridges goodbye. They don't, they're inkjet printers that don't use inkjet cartridges. They're all-in-one super tankers. They come with a lot of ink, a ridiculous amount of ink in the box, enough to print thousands of pages. In fact, you're going to get up to two years of ink in the box. And with each future replacement bottle ink set, another two years. So when you go to the store in 2021, actually, a couple of things you're going to like about it. When you go to the store, is that Shaq? When you go to the store in 2021, two years from now, you're going to say, wow, this is less, a lot less expensive, too. And then you're going to get another two years of ink. You're not going to run out of ink. That is the deal with supersized, easy-to-fill ink tanks. EcoTank printers mean fewer trips to the store, less frustration for you. EcoTank printers are changing the way people print. Get the compact EcoTank printer for your home or office so you can just fill and chill. Check out Epson.com. Now, I'm embarrassed by this URL, but I'm going to tell you anyway. EcoTank Leo. I did not invent the EcoTank. <laughs> I just like it. Epson.com slash EcoTank Leo. Transform the way your home or office prints. Check out Epson.com slash EcoTank Leo today to transform the way your home or office prints. Do away with out of ink frustration. The best combination of ease and value turn to the Epson EcoTank printers. Now through September 30th, when you buy an EcoTank, you'll get free overnight shipping, but you have to use the promo code EcoTank Leo at checkout for any EcoTank printer offer valid within the 48 contiguous states. Exclusions apply subject to availability. Epson. E-P-S-O-N dot com slash EcoTank Leo. My favorite is their slogan. EcoTank printers just fill and chill. Epson, ex exceed your vision. Shaq says, just fill and chill. 
I love, actually, we have EcoTanks in the studio. I have EcoTanks at home. We just love them. Uh, Dave Hamilton is here from the Mac Observer. It's great to have you, Dave. Andy Anako from Chicago, I'm sorry, Boston Public Radio. And Lori Gill from imore.com, where she is the managing editor. Update on the Zoom web server. Actually, I think there's an update on the update. So we talked about it last week. Zoom, which is that teleconferencing software that, you know, you install. And then, like most people, you probably uninstalled after the conference was over. If you did, what you didn't know is that they left a secret web server on your system. Uh Apple's pushed a silent Mac update to remove the Zoom web server because it turns out since even though you didn't have the Zoom software on there, since that web server was sitting there, if somebody sent you an invitation, you could they could actually turn on your camera and get you in a, in a conference without your knowledge. Uh, Zoom has also done an update, although the first Zoom update, I'm sorry, the first Apple update maybe didn't do enough because it's pushed another update. That's the latest Apple has pushed another automatic Mac software update to, for, to I guess, their additional Zoom-related vulnerabilities. Everybody's muted. Uh, no, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, just nobody's yeah. talking. No, no, we're just, we're just, everybody was gobsmacked. muted. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Karsten turned you all off. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think, Dave, uh, let Dave take this one. We, okay. I want to get Dave in here more. Yeah. Do, do so you this use is Zoom? Interesting. I used it this morning for a web conference. It's very with, popular. Uh, some company. It that's the thing is it's super popular and it works really well. And I think that is the reason their engineers originally created this this web server. Right? They wanted to give this seamless, fluid customer experience, right. and their engineers said, "I know how to do that." Right? Now they didn't think you know two steps beyond that. Like, hey, maybe somebody could exploit this. But the same could be said about SMTP, right? Like the engine that's used to send email. If the people knew about spam when they created it, they might not have created the same engine. <laughs> so, so I get it. But where the issue comes in is their response last week, right? Where they, Jean-Louis Gasset, who was the president of Apple France for a while, has this great concept called the two tokens concept of customer service. And he says, when a customer brings you a problem, there are two tokens on the table. One says it's nothing. The other says it's awful. And you get to pick up first. But whichever one you pick up, your customer picks up the other. You force them to. And Zoom came out and said, it's nothing. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not a good idea <laughs> because the customer then must. And by the customer, we mean all the rest of us got to pick up the it's awful token. Right. Right. They learned their lesson, I think. But, uh, you know, do they recover PR-wise from this? Actually, I think they do. A year I think from they now, did. If somebody asked you on a Zoom conference did. this morning, I think it's Correct. they're already fine. Uh, they're already I was wondering. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering. I think companies are so tied into it that they're, it's too hard for them to find another conferencing solution, and so they just use it. Yeah, it was a, a potential exploit. I don't think we heard of any... Uh, anyone using it, although there's no reason people couldn't have. Right. So, like, it's shut down... And it all happened very quickly, and Apple's fixes for it are probably credited to Zoom by many, many, uh, you know, non-techie people. And people are like, "I," because I mentioned it on the call. I'm like, because I, I was five minutes late or something, and they're like, why were you late? I'm like, well, I had to, you know, it's, you're using Zoom. I had to, like, go and get it again. <laughs> so Dieter, and, uh, Dieter Bone it says exactly this in the, in the Verge article. The core issue stems from a change Zoom made to its software to work around a security update Apple made to Safari, you probably noticed this, Safari was recently updated in such a way that it required user approval to open a third-party app every time. And Zoom didn't want to have users having to deal with that extra click. So they installed the web server that listened for calls to open up Zoom conferences. And uh, combined for that, the fact that it was uh, common and easy for Zoom users to have their default set to have video on when joining a call... That's when the maliciousness began. Zoom has backed down. Uh, they changed their attitude. They said, yeah, we're going to fix it. Apple did push a second fix out today. Uh, but these silent patches, you don't have to do anything, right? You don't even... Do, Andy, do, they, do you see them? I haven't seen them. No, I don't. I, no, I, I think I, they're just... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lori. I was just going to agree with you. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I, it's uh, they just simply happen when they're this important as security updates. They just simply happen. Uh, you don't have the option of, of turning them I down. Think I think that's good. I like that, and they yep. happen without your interaction, even. Yeah, and it's, it, this is a this is a really good example of sometimes the when Apple does something that's very very good and very very positive, such as creating all the new security uh, enhancements in the latest versions of uh, of macOS. Sometimes when you take this idea that is brilliant inside one infinite loop uh, or inside the spaceship campus and you put it out in the wild, it becomes all people people don't see the increased security. All they see is why is this app asking me for permission to do something that every computer should just be able to do on its own. Uh, and then the complaints, to, for instance, one, one complaint that I've been hearing from uh, a lot of developers was uh, that if a user's Dropbox folder and other like certain kinds of folders, they're in a certain place unless they, the user uh, changes the default. So this app should be able to find the Dropbox folder and sync to something very, very easily without forcing the uh, the user to go through dialog boxes or stuff like that. But now there's a, but then there was a a change so that now you have to actually ask for permission to use the, to, the, to go outside of this uh, outside of your box and find and actually find and locate the Dropbox folder. You have to ask the user, please locate my Dropbox folder for me. And from the user's point of view, suddenly the developer of this graphics app is an idiot who thinks, don't, you, you know where it is. You've always known where it is. Why do I have to suddenly point at the Dropbox folder for you? And they really can't can't say, Apple is making us do that. So sometimes to uh, to try to keep your customers happy, you find, you, you find yourself, again, if you're inside this conference room, not knowing how badly this will go once this is exposed to non-air-conditioned air. -conditioned air. Uh, <laughs> what, what, how, how can we get around this so that we're not inconveniencing our customers? I know, let's leave a persistent web server on the computer at all times that they never know about uh, and so it, this is not so much of them being idiots so much as they're wanting to make their customers happy but not thinking the requisite number of steps ahead not flipping to the end of the book to see what happens after they do this thing turns out uh, that there were others white labeling zoom's technology including ring central one of our former sponsors and jumu z-h-u-m-u -U, and that's what apple's uh doing these are white label versions of uh Zoom technology, so Apple is now removing those as well, even uninstalling. To answer your question before, Leo, whether these get installed automatically or not, I think they do no matter what, right. but if you go into System Preferences Software Update, there's an Advanced button in the lower right with three dots, which means there's more to it. If you click that, at the bottom of the list, at least in Mojave, is install system data files and security updates. Oh. I recommend leaving that checked. So I don't you could know uncheck if, that if you wanted to. You could uncheck it for but sure. Don't. Whether Why or would not you? that would have avoided the Zoom update from coming, right. I have no idea, right? But it's on I, by I would default. say leave that checked. That makes sense. And then there are people like you, yeah. Dave. You're working in there. Maybe you're using Pro Tools on a Mac, and, the, and you don't want to affect the stability of a system, and so you're afraid that in the middle of a recording session, Apple could push something. So there are people right. who would turn that off, of course. But uh, in the normal course of events, leave it on. I recommend leave it on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, let's see. What else is going on in the world of Macintosh? This is a rumor. I don't know. Well, you can tell me if it's credible. This comes from uh, Tom's Hardware. Apparently, actually, originally came from Digitimes. Apple is killing its AR glasses. Due to alleged technical problems, the report came from Digitimes, which, as Tom's hardware points out, has a mixed track record. In fact, Ming-Chi Kuo in March said that supply sources confirmed Apple may produce those glasses as soon as the end of 2019. But Digitimes is also a supply chain rumor mill. What do we know about this? Is this a permanent issue? Is Apple giving up on AR? Remember that... Tim Cook was saying AR at every single analyst call, right, Laurie? Every time, over and over, and he stopped. He did not mention it at all in the last analyst call, right? He didn't mention it at all at the last analyst call. I I don't know how much credit I would put to this particular um, rumor, though. It there, is just a rumor, we should say. Apple said nothing. Right, and, and you know, there's, there's something to be said for the technology isn't there yet. Right. Okay, so if Apple has done enough research and development to realize that right now, today, they can't make the AR glasses that they want to make, they're going to shelve it, and they're going to wait until the technology does exist, and then they're going to make it. It doesn't mean that there's like a 
a problem with design inside Apple. It means that, you know, how long have we been hearing about an yeah. Apple TV? Not not the Apple TV box, but this television set that yeah. Apple was supposedly making 15 years ago, they were talking about it, and it still hasn't happened, the Apple car. These are, you know, the companies out there doing all this research to try to figure out whether or not they can actually do this. And there might come a point where they decide right now, the technology doesn't exist for us to do this. So we're going to shelve it until the, until it does. And that makes a lot of sense. I think all companies do things like that. So I don't think it's scrapped. I think that if if it's at all, it's just being shelved until there's, you know, a little more advancement in in what we can do. Yeah, I, I think that I, I agree 100%. Uh, I think that uh, for one, Apple does have a very successful uh, AR consumer device. And it's called the iPhone. Uh, that's, that's all we've been seeing in the, in the past two or three years. It's it's a interface to augmented reality that consumers are willing to use and willing to introduce into their lives. And you can do some really nice, really, really effective uh, tools, uh, things with it, not just uh, things like uh, aiding maps, not just doing games, but uh, uh, did you know that uh, as part of the 50th anniversary of the moon landings, uh, they have, <laughs> the Smithsonian has an actual 3D model of uh, the Apollo 11, 11 command module that you could just put it right on the desk and just zoom around and just take a, an absolute tour through. Uh, so these phones are really the only way you can do augmented reality for on a consumer level. If you want to do it on a uh, on a on, on a, like a business level, if you want to do it for for consulting, uh, you can have something. You can have something like Google Glass, uh, which is being manufactured and sold. You can have something uh, like uh, like Microsoft's product, which again is being uh, manufactured and sold. It's a really kind of goofy looking piece of headwear that you wear because you are working in an architecture firm and you absolutely need to be able to show off, you do walkthroughs of certain properties uh, or you you're, uh, need to be able to teach somebody how to fix a certain aircraft component uh, in a way that's more effective than having a three ring binder next to, a, next to an engine. Uh, the pro but the problem with augmented reality and the reason why I kind of, I'm, I am, uh, I am uh, prejudiced to believe the report that Apple is backing away from immediate plans is that I have never, I, I don't, I haven't seen a single technology that would provide augmented reality in a, a in a way that people would expect for it to work, where you look around and things there are things in your field of vision that aren't actually really there. I not could be incorporated in a non goofy looking device that that consumers would simply buy the way they would buy AirPods, the way that they would buy iPhones. Uh, and secondly, there's the second huge problem is that. Uh, people like us who wear glasses have a huge, huge advantage over people who don't in that I can buy a neat pair of like Bose headphones that are built into uh, eyeglass frames and be walking around all the time uh, with headphones on without appearing as though I'm wearing headphones. Whereas if you don't wear glasses naturally, uh, you are forced to basically put something on your face you wouldn't normally have on your face. You're, the lenses are not doing anything useful for correcting your vision. They're just there to put more stuff in front of your face. Are you going to get people to put something on their faces uh, apart from sports glasses, apart from sunglasses, just to get augmented reality features? Uh, so I'm not saying that this breakthrough hasn't happened. It's just that I haven't seen it anywhere. So I'd be given that Apple would not want to be the company that would want to make a god sort of thing they wouldn't they don't want to make a a pair of like swim goggles that has a cable to a, a pod that you have to wear uh, on your hip for cooling and for for processing I just wasn't able to see how Apple would be able to manufacture something that would be very very Apple like yeah I just uh, I don't think anybody will ever be uh, hold on a second I just got a message <laughs> I don't think anybody will ever be uh, doing oh these are very annoying okay <laughs> <laughs> so we have a couple of these in-house uh, what, this one is uh, who makes these? Vuzix Blade. This is a Vuzix Blade, and then there's another company that, in fact, Anthony went down to San Francisco. He said, "Hey, you want to go down to San Francisco get fitted for some AR glasses tomorrow?" I said, "That sounds incredibly annoying." No, I do not. <laughs> he went down, so his is yours are coming this week, I think, right? Tomorrow he's getting them. So we're going to do some reviews on these, um, but. Jason Howell had these Vuzix for a while, and he said, no, I can't do it anymore. Because you look, well, first of all, what do I look like? Do I look good? Roy Everson. You don't look bad. <laughs> I, I look great, but not bad. So look. Anthony was wearing them this morning, and I thought, what, did you a go to the bio. eye doctor? Did you get your pupils dilated? Why are you wearing these weird? Oh, 
He just asked me if I wanted coffee. That's the other problem. <laughs> I am talking to you, and like this color message, this is a heads-up display, not like the Google Glass where it was over your eyebrow. So while I'm looking out, I see the world. It looks like I'm maybe a little bit wearing sunglasses. But this is projecting onto the back of the screen messages and notifications. If I tap this, I can see the weather forecast. I can see <laughs> other things. I can see Anthony's uh, messages. Um, let's see. Here's home. It's July 16th. It's 1.11 p.m. Uh, I can see cache data, user data. I don't know why. Maybe I'm on the some sort of weird uh, settings thing. This has its own <laughs> processor, its own memory. What was your battery life like, Anthony? Did you get through the day with this uh, thing? That's what I'm trying to find out. Yeah. Very good. Probably not. I'm at 50% now. You yeah. started wearing them what time? This morning. So. so, yeah, it won't get through the full day. Um, now, admittedly, we're at the uh, Atari VCS stage of this. We're, we're <laughs> uh, you know, this is very early days of the technology. But I could see if Tim Cook, you know, Johnny said, hey, before I leave... I'd like to show you something. And Tim Cook comes in and puts these on. I can see him saying, not today, Johnny, not today. Um, it's just there. I, it is very early days yet. I mean, it's it's there. I think there'll be people who will want this, I guess. I wouldn't. I don't know. And, Lori, do you think I, uh, I'm i a good-looking fella in these? Or if, if, <laughs> if I walked up to you at a sick burn concert and I just said, Hey, man, you're so good. Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Would you uh, reject me out of hand? Uh, the glasses are, <laughs> the are they're weird looking. They, yeah. I, they definitely, they those those ones, the one you, you're wearing, they look like a guy who's trying to show everybody how cool he is, yeah. but his glasses aren't cool enough to really yeah. make that work. Okay, yeah, what's your yeah. About um, definitely, when it comes to design. <laughs> That you know the AR glasses are just failing 100. percent I, I but they have to be because they have to contain you know batteries and there's a PC in here and there's all this stuff. To me, I look like this. I'd be more likely to come up to you and say, "Now is the time on sprockets when we dance." Mm -hmm. Or, no, no, <laughs> there's, this isn't a hidden camera. I'm not. It's not secretly I'm not, taking video. Of I'm you. not recording you. Don't pay no attention <laughs> right. to my swiping. Right. But but think about Both? this. So. What wearables had been around uh, watches, smartwatches had been around for a while before Apple finally jumped into the to the smartwatch industry. And what did they do? They came out presenting it to you as this well-designed luxury piece. I think AR glasses could be the same thing. Yeah, maybe. The, to me, there's still an issue with the thing popping up in front of your eyes. It's a little annoying. <laughs> oh, there's one other thing. These are $700. So uh, you're paying a price to be that guy. And honestly, if you wear them, you are that guy. Anthony? That guy. You are that guy. <laughs> Thank you for letting me uh, wear those. Uh, you know, but again, uh, if you, you know, if, if I got an Atari VCS and I was playing Pitfall with my little plastic joystick and I said, someday these games are going to be so immersive, you'll think you're living in them. You, you said, not, yeah, but not today, buddy. We're at the early days. I don't know whether to credit yeah. this rumor or not. Yeah, it's. I, I think that right now uh, mobile AR is kind of like where smartphones were before mobile broadband. Where, okay, it's very, very nice. Uh, I'd have to, boy, have a re really good reason to have a full pocket-sized computer on me at all times. And we don't have this. But once we get the secret sauce of, well, what if you could actually browse the web and actually do things on the Internet wherever you are and get your email and not have to relay it through like a text messaging uh, portal or something like that. That's when that's the secret sauce that made it all work. Yeah. We were waiting for the secret sauce technology to make actual real consumer mobile AR work. Reverb Mike in the chat room says, no, no, Leo, you look like Bono. <laughs> the difference mind. is every you're not time Bono. I That's snap my fingers. <laughs> I'm not Bono. If I were Bono, no one would say anything. Yeah. That's right. Well, maybe the uh, rumor comes from Apple had to shelve it until they could hire Johnny's design company to dream it up. Maybe. So maybe. Maybe that's. I think. There's, yeah, I think. Be. You know, we saw. Remember how all the mockery with the Google Glass? It hasn't gone away. This is as, you know, has the same issues that Google Glass had. So I don't know. I maybe it'll be a hearable. Maybe you know. Maybe Apple's going to do something with the yeah. AirPods instead. I uh, I really seriously think that the the 
breakthrough is really going to be in a, a, an even more compact version of the AirPods yeah. because the ability to simply have a conversation with Shlomo and have it not not only ask it questions and get information back that you need, uh, but the ability for it to uh, click a button and say, by the way, you are allowed to interrupt me and actually say things. Now, now imagine all of that plus something the size of like a ball, a camera the size of a ballpoint pen that you have in your front pocket that faces forward so it can feed video to your phone so we can say, oh, by the way, and an earpiece says, oh, by the way, that, that uh, I recognize that person. You met you met her at a conference two years ago. Her name is Shelly. Uh, she works for Obata. And uh, he, and the you, last time you last time you emailed, you talked about this. Like, Shelly, how are, th are you still with Obana? I, that, there's so many great things you could do without necessarily having uh, uh, actual screens in front of your eyes, so long as the device can see out, and so long as it can talk to you through, the, through your ears or even just through some discrete taps. So how's, that how's is the device going to see? Are you going to wear a funny hat? No, I'm, no, I'm saying, but what, what if you have like a device like a, the size of a pen where you just in your just pocket, in your front pocket, yeah, yeah. right? Exactly, and just with a little, like a lens popping up in the in the front. Oh, that's so it not can at all creepy. Out. Oh, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> no, no, no. So well, I want I, this, I, right? Apple. This is Jane <laughs> from Ender's Game. Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah. I want Jane yeah. from Ender's Game, but I want privacy first before somebody makes yeah. me Jane. Well, because if I don't both. have privacy first, Jane then... has to see everything. Jane has to join you Jane in, in the bathroom. To... Otherwise, you don't have right. Jane. <laughs> Jane needs to know things that that are only mine to know. That's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that, that's yeah. that's why the, the that pen camera has like a has a swivel lens that swivels all the way 180 <laughs> degrees to to face the, the the cloth of your shirt if you need to. Yeah. I'm sorry. And Andy, a, and, your, and a little light. Pen camera is just not going to work. <laughs> 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 Fine, then I guess you don't want to be invited on my super mega party yacht when I make a billion dollars off this idea. Good to, I, I, I guess your band does not want to be paid a half a million dollars to pay to play at my IPO party. My Good name's to know. not Jane. I don't work at Obana. I don't know who the hell you are. And why is there a camera sticking out of your pocket? And the, next, and the next time I see you, like my earpiece will say, oh, uh, her name is Lori Gill. Uh, she, does, she does not own three mansions because you offered her a spot on the ground floor of your business oh, and she made yes. fun of you instead. Oh, yes. Dream on, Anako. Dream on. Please don't be mean to her. She really regrets it. Our show today brought to you by LastPass. I use LastPass. You should use LastPass. In fact, I just locked myself out of my of Firefox because I use LastPass. And I'm really a strong believer in... Not not only two-factor authentication, but using a dongle for two-factor authentication. This is the YubiKey. Unfortunately, I uh, I, lo I forgot my YubiKey Type-C to Type-A adapter in this computer. This silly Windows computer doesn't have any Type-C adapters, so I couldn't, I couldn't open up Firefox. But that's kind of what you want, right? You don't want any way you can sneakily get around your two-factor authentication because LastPass has all your information. And I, by the way, I trust LastPass so much that I put my driver's license, my social security numbers, my passport images, LastPass is the last password vault you'll ever need. It's a vault that uses super strong encryption. In fact, they do everything, right? Not just strong uh, uh, encryption, but they use PBK, PBK day, PBKDF2 to uh, make it impossible or at least very, very difficult to brute force your password. Uh, I have my PBKDF2 set to, I think, 100,000 iterations. That means every single time a bad guy tries a password for brute force, he has to go through 100,000 iterations before he can do the next password and the next one. It's virtually impossible. It's little things like that. LastPass does it right. Your LastPass vault is only decrypted on device, never anywhere else, including the LastPass servers. And they have apps for every browser, every device, it's the first thing I install when I get a new phone, when I get a new browser, when I get a new computer, I put LastPass on it. Because all I have to do is remember my master password and have my YubiKey or whatever two-factor you want to use. And, uh, and, and then I can get into every other password. LastPass has just done something very exciting for us. We use LastPass Enterprise. Every business should be using LastPass because really the weak link in your business is the employees. They have the passwords to your bank account, to your, you know, your bookkeeping system, to your servers, to everything. And that means that's a vulnerability. With LastPass, they can get access to those services, those websites, that information, without actually having a password. You can easily change it. You can completely control it. And with LastPass's new business lineup, 
This has gotten even better. This is brand new. LastPass Enterprise now includes single sign-on technology. And, you know, this is always the problem is how do we balance security with convenience? You know, you can do it wrong like Zoom did, or you could do it right like LastPass does. Single sign-on technology. There's 1,200, more than 1,200 now, pre-integrated apps. So in addition to its existing market-leading password management capability, LastPass Enterprise lets your employees log on simply to all 1,200-plus of those apps. They manage access for every entry point with one solution. Apps that are covered by SSO, it's easy, it's fast. If they're not, it's the old-fashioned but still very you know successful way of doing a password and two-factor. They go beyond even two-factor now with MFA, multi-factor authentication. They're using biometrics. They're using other factors like geolocation. LastPass MFA ensures only the right users are accessing the right data at the right time. Again, without adding complexity or inconvenience to your users, but they're locking down the security. That's the key. LastPass really knows what they're doing with this. Finally, there's LastPass Identity. This is a combination of the LastPass Enterprise features and the new LastPass MFA features. As an IT guy or a security guy, you're going to love this with a holistic view of end user activity from a single dashboard. Passwords, authentication, all the apps in use, single sign-on, password management, adaptive authentication, these are state-of-the-art tools, now yours from LastPass and LastPass Identity, where you'll get granular control plus frictionless access. It's kind of the, the, holy, the holy grail of password management. We love LastPass. I've been using it for as long as it's been around, I think almost 10 years. Uh, we use it, of course, at work. We offer it as a benefit to all our employees because I want them to be safe at home, too. LastPass, bridging the gap between access and authentication to simply and securely manage identity. That's really what it's all about. 13 and a half million people use LastPass. They're loving it and trusting it. Tens of thousands of businesses. Visit lastpass.com slash twit. Find out how they can help you. Thank you, LastPass. Lastpass.com slash twit. Can I mention what we're doing with LastPass in October? No? Okay. Not yet. Stay tuned. <laughs> I'm excited. But I will, uh, I will wait. We'll do. We'll, we'll tell you about it in a little bit. So, <clears throat> I love. I have to say, I've said it before. I love my 2018 MacBook Air. It is kind of, even though it's got the Butterfly 3 keyboard, I find it usable enough. I love it that it doesn't have a touch bar, but does have fingerprint ID. It's got a Retina screen. It's good enough, fast enough, not super fast, but fast enough to do all the things I want to do. So, uh, Danny Cepeda over there at iMore has a surprise for us. The new 2019 MacBook Air is slower in at least one respect than last year's. Laura, you want to talk about this? Yeah, so um, the best that, that, that I think we can understand from this is that um, for, for the sake of getting the price down, it's, it's possible that Apple put in a... Um, Lower SSD to um, just it, if you if you read the information on on the percentage difference, um, it's not very much. So they well, to keep the price point down. They might have just kind of it's still fast. Let's put it that way. But it is thirty five percent slower, which I I think is more than <laughs> a little bit uh, slower. So um, this is using the Black Magic Disk Speed Test. Uh, it comes from Consumac. Uh, now, remember, there isn't an SSD in these MacBook Airs. This is soldered in memory, and the T2 chip uses, is the controller. It's a software controller. So, But it is conceivable that they put different uh, memory in there, cheaper memory in there to reduce the price, right? Right, right. Yeah, so it, I think the idea being that um, there's an exchange of, of price for speed because most people... Um, the MacBook Air is not their heavy machine. It's kind of intended to be right. used as sort of their light browsing the internet kind of machine. And so it doesn't necessarily need that faster, uh, that fast, faster processor speed or that, that faster kind of usability. So if, you know, if, 
if there's a reason why it would be, um, let's drop the price of the MacBook Air because everybody complained about how expensive it was when it first came out. And at the same time, let's use a, a slightly cheaper chip so that we can, you know, afford this kind of um, exchange. And most people wouldn't notice it. No. And I really do believe that most people wouldn't notice that change. The that difference it, between writing difference. a gigabyte a second versus 0.9 gigabytes a second <laughs> is not going to make a big difference. Reading is a lot faster. It's uh, it, it, it's my old MacBook Air is two gigabytes per second. The newer MacBook Air is 1.3 gigabytes per second. But that's gigabytes, not gigabits. You're reading one and a third gigabytes every second. I can't think of a lot of applications where you need anything faster than that. So I think that's a reasonable place. They cut the price. With the yeah, with the CPU that's in there, I, I right. think you're going to... I have the same MacBook Air. I have the, the original OG 2018 MacBook Air. And right. like you, I love it. It's yeah. a great machine. I, but I see it hit CPU walls long before I right. see it ever hit disk read walls. So, right. yeah, I don't, I, I don't... I think this is actually a smart move on Apple's part. One, it's a 1.6 gigahertz dual core i5 that's in there it's probably i'm thinking it's a u part but i don't know maybe it's a y part um apple's not real forthcoming in the tech specs and that but to get 100 bucks uh, off the price yeah why you know it is a y part it's a y part the, so that's uh, the slower the well the in the original processes. air yeah yeah, assume yeah, it is. yeah 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 so i guess the real memorial here is don't buy the new one thinking you're gonna get a faster one if you already have a 2018 you're good <laughs> no need not that anybody would be crazy enough to do that uh, the walkie-talkie act, speaking of uh, flaws, is being disabled. Does anybody... Did, I used it. Lisa and I used it. I got the new watch. I was so excited. I got the new watch OS. We used it for about two days. And then she said, I'm not using this anymore. <laughs> I'll, I'll text you if I need you. Does anybody use walkie-talkie? Anybody? So uh, I was talking about this on the I'm More show. Um, the, there are use cases where this could be really beneficial. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I was just making sure that you yes. weren't muted. <laughs> yes, I um, heard every use, word. Okay, there are use cases where this can be very beneficial. And Georgia Dow was talking about how her and her husband and her kids use it every of time course they go out Georgia to the uses. mall or to the store. <laughs> of course, <laughs> Georgia uses um, they, they use it to, to communicate with each other when they go separately to do a little yeah. shopping. It's yeah. their, their quick and easy way to chat with each other. I am like you, Leo, that I tried it out at first with Renee, and I've never used it yeah. since then. Um, but I can see a very limited use case, or for some people that have sort of picked it up and they're using it regularly, that this is actually a really great feature for them that they've come to sort of enjoy and trust and think of it as like they're, they're sort of helping, helping friend. So um, it, I hope that Apple doesn't permanently take it away. I don't think they will, but because it doesn't seem to be used a whole lot, I could, I could maybe imagine that they were like, well... There's this this flaw. Let's just get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, they did say we've disabled func the function as we quickly fix the issue. So the issue was that it could be used to eavesdrop on you. Okay, that's kind of an issue. It was a similar uh, problem with the the FaceTime bug. Remember where somebody could uh, create a group conversation without your knowledge. Uh, the walkie-talkie app apparently would allow somebody to listen in uh, on your phone. Or maybe your watch. I don't know. It must be your watch, right? So they, rather than try to figure it out, they just say, just as they did with the FaceTime bug, they disabled the feature until a fix could be made. But they did say they're going to quickly fix it. I hope they do. Basically, the same exploit that that Zoom fell prey to, just handled differently. Interesting. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Uh, you know, that's the, the right thing to do is fix it. And um, but yeah, I hope they. I guess for those for Rene, for Georgia Dow, I guess I hope they fix it. That actually does make sense with kids because you don't necessarily. But then that means every kid has to have an Apple Watch. <laughs> well, it's, well it's, her it's family, a, it's every a, kid does have an Apple Watch. Probably, we got Georgia's <laughs> too. Yeah, 
Yeah, it, it's it's nice to have that feature for people who are going to take advantage of it, particularly families. I, I know a lot of families that actually have like a little bag of uh, FRS radios. that's like re yeah. really good modern walkie talkies exactly for that reason, yeah. because it's a, you can either like text message somebody and you're going through a network or and you don't know like how choked things are going to be. Or you can simply push a button on this 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 walkie talkie you got uh, uh, for four for four hundred dollars. You they get a ping they know it's you uh, and you're immediately talking to this person so yeah it's i'm glad that i'm <laughs> apple is definitely on top of these things you're isn't it great when you hear about this first from the company yeah. themselves yeah. rather than that's from, the right way to do it <laughs> from yeah exactly from yeah. Uh, from washington post or something yeah. somebody else so that's what we expect from apple there are times when i would like to have instant communication the problem is really that text messaging isn't really all that reliable even i messages isn't really uh, all that reliable either somebody doesn't have the phone or sometimes going through a gateway from one carrier to another that doesn't get through uh, or can be delayed. So it isn't, you know, or maybe just Lisa's ignoring me when I ask her when she's going to be home for dinner. But <laughs> Could be the recipient. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it'd be nice if I could say, hey, when are you going to be home? Dinner's ready. Uh, <laughs> Apple TV Plus coming soon. Yes, we think. That's what they say. Yep, they got to got to have it up by August or September, don't they? Yeah, they certainly have to have it ready before the next iOS comes out, because if they miss this window of saying here is our new app uh, for dealing with this service, and they don't bundle it in with every single phone that ships, uh, every single brand new phone that ships, they will have missed a huge opportunity. Already, so we're saying, hearing uh, budgets. This is uh, for the uh, the C, which is the TV show where in the future no one can see. Fifteen million dollars an episode, which is pretty stunning. That's Game of Thrones season eight money. I mean, that's that's big bucks. And I talked to somebody who uh, worked on the set of one of the other Apple shows who said, "Yeah, they they were never price conscious. <laughs> they had <laughs> they had money to burn. They were glad to spend the money." So, um, that's I the guess, right way they have to do it, right? I sure. mean, if they they want to step in as a major player, they have to act. Go like big or go a home. major player and then some. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Tim Cook and Eddie Q are at uh, the big Sun Valley media conference. Here's a picture of them in their sporty collared shirts. Uh, Tim's wearing a polo shirt. Eddie looks like he's wearing a Tommy Bahama. Uh, this is uh, going on right now in Sun Valley, Idaho. Technology and media moguls gather. This is the eighth year in a row Tim and Eddie have been at the conference. The other big uh, joining them, by the way, it's in Sun Valley, are uh, General Motors CEO, Comcast CEO, Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn, Sheryl Sandberg, COO of Facebook, and Uber CEO, Dara Khosrowshahi. Uh, it's a big, big deal, this Sun Valley conference. The other big rumor that we've been hearing is that iOS 12.4 will come out, and when it does, so will the Apple card, and some say this is the week. It's possible. We thought Apple Card was going to be out um, when when the App Store went down. I, a lot of us were like, "Is it yesterday?" Is the, the App Store card? went is down. The Apple yeah. Card? yeah, yeah. Or with or the uh, sorry, uh, um, the uh, Apple's retail store. Yeah, right. That yeah, like they were trying to stick it in there, but they but nothing. <laughs> it was no change anybody could see. Uh, you're going to get an Apple Card, Lori. <laughs> Are you going to get an Apple card, Lori? <laughs> Wait, Thank let me you. push the walkie-talkie um, <laughs> button. Are you going to get an Apple card, Lori? <laughs> she, you didn't hear we me. Do, Go ahead. We need to walkie-talkie that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I will be getting an Apple card. I'm actually very excited about it. Yeah. you were. I remember when, when we were talking about it, you were. How about you, Andy? Uh, Apple card, a titanium Apple card saying Andrew uh, Anatko in the future? Uh, I would like to try it out. I think that's more of a limitation of my credit rating than it would be for, uh, <laughs> oh, for no. my desire. Apple will Apple give card. anybody one of those, right? You just might not get <laughs> yeah, a good right. interest rate. Well, if they, if, if they give it to me, that'll prove it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't, they, that's one of the things they said, though, is that they're, they're going to be more generous uh, in, in offering that card. I just yeah, want it because it's titanium. A... I could cut my meat with it. <laughs> it is cool. Have you seen one in person? No, have you, have you one, Dave? Dave? Yeah, I have. I probably 
maybe I'm not supposed to. I won't say whose I held, but yeah, I I held one as they bought me coffee or something. Oh, that's uh, neat. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, yeah, it's heavy. Like it, it is. Oh, really? Exactly what you would expect. Yeah, yeah. It's it's more substantial than a credit card. So yeah, yeah. I um, have a metal. I'd like uh, it if I could. I have a metal but, Amex card. I don't know, maybe because I've been a member of Amex since 1980. It was thicker than those. Okay. Um. Yeah, but yeah. it but it had that same kind of heft I could cut to me it. with this. But, yeah, you wouldn't but, cut meat with the Apple one. It it was <laughs> as you would expect. It it was you know glorious to hold and and yeah. felt like yeah of course. There's yeah. a glow coming off of it. Right. This this one right. um, has a number. It's etched into the metal, but it does have a number. Apple's does not. It just has a name, no signature field or anything, right? But there is a chip. Yeah, yeah. Andy, are they kicking you out? Uh, no, there are some kids that seem to think that they have access to this room, but they do not. <laughs> Okay, we're going to be done in time. Don't worry. Tell <laughs> yeah. those kids Santa will be here in half an hour. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'll get I'll get one. I guess. I mean, we should, I want to play with it. You don't have to use it. You could just have it, put it on the wall, frame it. Yeah. Was it when you? It's good so, to have more open credit. What so, was it like, you know. Dave? Yeah, right. No, it's not. But <laughs> what, no, it is. Is it? I got an eight fifty credit rating. Yeah, what? no, that's totally the way. I uh, know. <laughs> you got yeah. an eight. That's as high as it gets. As high as it gets, man. Yep, it's true. See, I thought that your I thought your FICO score goes down a little bit if you have too much money you can borrow. No, it's it's the percentage you want a low percentage of borrowed money as compared Versus to how much you could much borrow. Because mm. it shows responsibility or something. But yes. Yeah. It, it well, always I, it like. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Dave yeah, Hamilton so responsibility. Yeah. That's always gone together in my book. Well, this is, this is <laughs> I. This is this is this does point out a really good opportunity for Apple to teach people about credit and teach people about how these things work. I mean, I, I was shocked the time I real when I had a, a a long conversation with like a, a friend who was a banker who said that no 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 see you don't understand the fact that you have always you you've always taken the philosophy that I'm not going to buy anything unless I can actually afford to buy it uh, and you paid and you basically buy your cars for cash and you pay all your bills as soon as they come in that establishes that you're a terrible credit risk because. Because you've never like borrowed ten thousand dollars and then paid it back, and I'm like, you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, the ways of high finance are mysterious to the likes of you uh, and I. I know I am a poor little country mouse, <laughs> but uh, we shall we shall turn to Brother David from now on right. for the deep <laughs> insights. Yeah, can you, can you co-sign a bunch of stuff for me Mr. because Mr. Eight Fifty. <laughs> So there's a reason score. that it remains 850, and and uh, answering answering no to questions like that, I think, is a big part. <laughs> of it. But, uh, but yeah, I will get one. I you know I like my Marriott points that I earn, so I'm not sure if I'll use it oh, routinely, yeah. but I'll get yeah. one. That's with it. Yeah. Um, I think they're going to have to do. Uh, it's an app, right? So the whole application process happens on your iPhone, doesn't it? It's, that was my impression. So yeah. th they'll have to do the, either a system wallet, update. I think, I think it's going to have to be an iOS update. Yeah, that's the yeah. rumor. I'm I'm almost positive that you'll have to update your phone in order to access the uh, the new Apple Card application right. that I believe will be in the wallet app. Oh, I see. Oh, that makes sense. Finally, the wallet is actually a wallet. <laughs> um, all right. So I'll just keep looking. Now, here's a question. Somebody asked us on iOS today, and we didn't know the answer. There's historical precedent for this. If you do decide to do the iOS 13 public beta... Will Apple push out the app on the public beta as well as on iOS 12.4? Or will you have to wait till September to get an Apple card? <laughs> Any I, question? I, mm. you'll probably, yeah. they, everyone probably has to do it at the same time. Micah, Micah thought that that had happened uh, with an iOS 11 to 12 update. That Some people on the public beta didn't get a feature. Yeah, I think it was ECG, the EKG uh, feature of the watch. Because they were on the next generation and they didn't have an update for that. So if you think you want an Apple card, do not do the public beta of iOS 13 or at least preserve one device. I'm going to think you can't use, could you use this, the iPad to apply for the app? See, it's so many questions. Mm. <laughs> so many questions. I don't know. I, I would have... I would guess that you would have to have an iPhone 
because the importance of a cellular telephone number is right. become has become more and more important because people can move from place to place to place, but that as an identifier and as a means of contact of with you remains the same. This is uh, and this is why so many different apps try very very hard to get you to sign up for two-factor authorization uh, uh, auth uh, authentication because if they have their phone your phone number, they basically have this basically the keys to the castle that right. will unlock all kinds of other information about you because it's constant from use to use to use. That's so why I, I have a YubiKey instead of a phone a text yeah. messaging, yeah. But yeah, there, there, there's so many advantages to the Apple Card that yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll happily like take that rejection letter <laughs> <laughs> on the off chance that I might get like a two hundred two hundred fifty dollar buy spending so, limit. And <laughs> so now we'll have to ask the question: Did you get the Apple invitation? Did you get the rejection letter? <laughs> it's just Apple. Apple's breaking our hearts back and all the time. Um, AirDrop was being used. This I thought was interesting. This is a story from uh, Quartz. AirDrop was being used by the Hong Kong protesters to pamphlet visitors from China. Chinese visitors unable to, you know, they had to go through the Great Firewall of China, even in Hong Kong. So when you arrive, in fact, they uh, the, in the Quartz story, they talked about arriving uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong and being bombarded via AirDrop. Here, this is Alice Su arrived at TST station immediately bombarded with anti-extradition bill flyers via airdrop and simplified Chinese. The fact that it's in simplified mm -hmm. Chinese tells you it's aimed at mainland Chinese users. They don't use it in Hong Kong. And, of course, they've been blacked out as to what's going on in Hong Kong. So a uh, very interesting choice of technologies for propaganda airdrop. Yeah. Also, pretty dangerous because they're prob uh, they're going to have those people are going to have to pass back through a border at some point, at which their phones can and will probably will be collected. And what happens when they see this, uh, when the officials at the border yeah. see this flyer or this this uh, this material on their phones that they didn't ask for, and maybe they were even not terribly aware uh, existed. So mm, I'm worried about that. That's a good point. I didn't think about. It. You have to accept it though. You can't. But you yeah, might accidentally maybe, accept it. You maybe you, you accepted something because you didn't know what right. was what, what was happening, and then you forgot to simply delete it. Uh, or maybe uh, there are forensic tools available to border control that can find the thing that, that got deleted. Uh, and now you're now you're, you're, you're talking about credit scores. Your social your social credit score is going down, and now you can't buy a train ticket to anywhere because you're no, you're no longer trustworthy. Our pact is back. This was the software. In fact, the New York Times did a story about our pact, which is parental control software and a bunch of other parental control software that had been kicked from the Apple store a few months ago because they used MDM. That's the uh, Apple mobile device managing certificate that allows, well, it was intentionally intended originally for enterprises to allow them to control and snoop on uh, employees' iPhones Apple, in its original um, rules for the App Store, said you can't use MDM as a private company. They've changed those rules and put uh, our pact back in. The new rules say that MDM is intended for enterprise or parental control apps. So uh, It amazes me what MDM and VPN have been like the creative uses that app developers have found to sort of get around the limitations of iOS using MDM and VPN. It, like, I, I think this is a good use of, of MDM. It is, although Apple's honest. initial, uh, I think Apple's initial complaint still stands that it can be, you know, MDM shouldn't be used by standard apps because you know, if you're using an employee's phone, there's an implicit understanding that this is a company phone. The company will monitor you. In fact, it's often explicit. It should be explicit if you're a company, right. but you're not required to make it explicit. I guess, I mean, parents have the right to monitor what their kids are doing on their phone. But there's also the concern that our pact or any other company that's using MDM can also see that data. Uh, and I thought Apple's initial reasons for yanking it were genuine. I didn't actually buy the New York Times contention that they pulled it because it was competition for Apple's own screen time technology. Uh, well, you know. Yeah, I didn't buy that either. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, so, but I so think... So is the privacy thing not a real thing now, or...? It depends on how they're using the data, right? Or where where the data is flowing. Maybe uh, they've got maybe they've got a way of, of keeping it from going back to the developer. Yeah. That would be yeah. good, yeah. This, remember, yeah, MDM was also used by local, Facebook to uh, spy on... Uh, 
with your permission, spy on how you used your phone with a, quote, VPN app that Facebook was offering. Go ahead. I'm sorry, yep. Dave. No, that that's exactly it. Is I, I as long as we, we gotta find out more about where the data is going and yeah, yeah. who gets to see it and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. like, you know, what one dot one or Cloudflare with their one dot one dot one dot one app uh, is Love doing that. like to use VPN as sort of the hack to to get into the network settings of your phone. That's awesome. Uh, it's yeah. so creative and and effective. Like yeah. it really works. Yeah. Yeah, actually Steve uh, Gibson uh, was talking about a new uh, I think a very smart uh, policy that uh, some people are advocating Firefox uses called uh, DNS over HTTPS. The problem, yeah. which is kind of what one dot does as well, the problem it's the is same thing. it's right. the same thing. Is that when you're doing your DNS query, your internet service provider sees what sites you want to go to and records that and can sell it to marketers. In fact, often does. So one dot, you put that on your smartphone, or you, I guess you could use it on your computer as well does an encrypted query to Cloudflare and then on to the rest of the world so that your ISP can't see what you're doing. Um, and that's and so in the same thing with HTTPS uh, DNS. Uh, we talked about that last week on Security Now. I'm sure Steve will have more uh, to say about that as well. This Security Now just around the corner, as a matter of fact. Uh, let us pause and get your picks of the week. And uh, then we will uh, let Andy get out of the library. <laughs> Our show today, bro. Oh. What? I'm gonna hang. I'm gonna hang out here. I'm just. I'm oh, just gonna. Stay out of the room. Let room. the kids yeah. in. That's what I should. Free have said. comics. Free magazines. Is it? Is it free, free? It's not free comic day today, is it? No, 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 no. Not just today. in the they, library. They, every they day. Have, they have comics. Got magazines. Every day everything. is free comic day at the library. Support your local library, kids. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by Captera. Find the right tools. To do your business, a lot of people use line of business software that's woefully out of date. Internet Explorer 8 on Vista sound familiar to you? That is because the person or company who wrote that software is long gone. They haven't updated it, but your entire business runs on it. I know how it is. I've seen this happen. You search for the category you need. There are 700 categories, not just CRM, but IT project management, e-commerce, link management tools, web conferencing. And even specific line of business programs like veterinary office management or yoga studio management. Thousands of programs. But here's the best part. So you go in there. You say, here's what I'm looking for. I need software to monitor, you know, my whatever. Uh, what, what is that? Oh, I need CAD software. That's a good example. Yeah. Uh, but, I, but a specific kind of CAD. So you can narrow it down. See, on the left, there's all these filters where you can say features the program has. You can narrow it down by reviews. Uh, you know, how many stars it has, product rating. You can compare them then side by side. And there's so many apps on here, which is so nice, that it, you really have a broad choice. But this is when Captera really becomes valuable. 950,000 reviews of products with 1,000 new reviews every day. They're going to, in a couple of months, they'll have over a million up-to-date reviews by actual users. And that's what makes Captera so fantastic. You're not going in blind. You're going, you're getting recommendations for software, and then you're getting reviews from actual users so you can choose the right product for your needs. Stop suffering with old, out-of-date line of business software. Start using modern software. There's great new software out there. If you could only find it, now you can at Captera. Go to captera.com slash MacBreak. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash MacBreak. I kind of left the most important part out. It's absolutely free. Free. I know you'd pay for this. It's such a great service, but they don't charge. It's absolutely free. Captera.com slash Mac break. What a great service. Uh, support us by supporting them. And thank you, Captera, for your support. Go to Captera.com slash Mac break. Andy Anatko, let's start with you today. Your pick of the week. Mine's kind of a golden oldie, but it's still brand new. Uh, I, I was talking to Jason Snell the other day, and he was recommend saying how much he liked using Default Folder X uh, as, oh a, as a system enhancement on his Mac. And I'm like, exactly. That was my re that was my reaction. That's still to around. Default folder. 
That was exactly my reaction. Uh, the default is a, is a classic uh, Mac utility that uh, enhances the open save dialog so that every – think of almost everything that you ever do that involves like being confronted with an open save dialog. And then now, I, oh, I, sh I should go – I need to go into the finder to like – I need because I need to create this or I need to move this first. Or uh, gosh, why is it – why is it – why is this app always open uh, this folder when I really want to open this other folder on my Dropbox? All these things that are – that uh, complicate uh, open saved file dial, dial boxes, uh, default folder X will fix for you. So you can define like for a certain app, it will always, always, always bounce to a specific folder as the default, not whatever the uh, Mac OS thinks that you want to use. Uh, it will keep better track of recently used folders. It will uh, go directly to the finder from pretty much wherever you want to go on and on and on and on. Just little features that it just really just enhance everything that you do if it ever involves opening or saving a file, uh, and so and it's really well made. They're up they, they're updating it for Catalina. They have a beta for Catalina out right now for people who have uh, the public beta right now. So this is not like an abandoned app that was sort of sort of updated for for Mac OS 10, and maybe there's still some some diehards who are still using it. No, it's still a very very fresh and vital product. Uh, I downloaded the, uh, the the 30 day free trial a couple of weeks ago. And now I'm like, ah, dang it, I'm gonna have to buy this, aren't I? Because I'm now, now I'm too. Now when I switch from the MacBook to my desktop, which doesn't have it installed, I'm I'm annoyed that I can't use default folder. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, it's 35 bucks, but I'm very much in, the reason why this is still a modern completely uh, uh, up to date and completely well supported app in 2019 after 50 60 70 years it predates the moon landings as a matter of fact is the reason is because they charge a amount of money that is commensurate with the amount of work they put into it so i'm very very happy to give them 35 bucks for this it predates the moon landing no it That's doesn't what, well, uh, <laughs> that I, was 1969 you know, i don't think it's quite that old <laughs> Okay, well, were you were you looking like everywhere on the internet in 1968? You you had it downloaded from an Archie server, but you know, if you were in the know, if you're one of the cognoscenti, I love it. I can't, it is about that old. I mean, I I'm when yeah. I, I'm amazed that it's I haven't heard that name in so long. It's probably St. Clair Software is probably one guy named Bob St. Clair or something, right? That's just awesome. <laughs> yep. I just love it. John Gotel actually is oh, his name, oh. but it is one guy. One yep. guy. Really nice. <laughs> Yeah, see, Dave, you've been around long enough, too. You remember all of this. I do. Yeah. I do. That's awesome. Yeah. He's got some new stuff, too, he's uh, he's doing. So that's cool. Yep. Yeah. Can't believe it's it's 64-bit. Our, our little <laughs> our little program's all grown up. There, there weren't 64 bits in all of the computers in the world when this app was first released. <laughs> <laughs> this app was on the Apollo Guidance computer. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. See, this is this is actually this is why it costs so much money because it was distributed on braided rope core memory that had to be hand braided for every single installation. Haven't you been enjoying all the uh, documentaries? And the <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I could listen to uh, that's one small step for man over and over and over again. Actually, my the thing I always get chills uh, is not actually the first step on the moon, but the landing of the lunar lander and Neil Armstrong <laughs> saying Houston. Uh, Tranquility base here. Eagle has landed. I get chills just saying it out loud. And also, and also, co copy that tranquility. <laughs> thanks, thanks got a lot. A bunch you of guys got about to... they were turning blue today. And we're, we're breathing again. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I mean, I could hear that over and over again. I'm still getting chills. Uh, Fifty years later, what an I, I I think there's very few things human beings have done in our eighty thousand years on the planet that are as uh, as significant or as amazing or as just mind boggling as that. Yeah. Uh, Dave Hamilton, we are not going to be strangers. I hope you will come back. It's always a pleasure to have you on. I would love to come back. Mac yeah, Observer. Well, guys, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andy. I know you're done. That's why I started with you. Get yeah, back up, so, baby. So thanks a lot. See you later. See you, ne see you next week. Dave's Bye -bye. at the Mac Observer, <laughs> MacObserver.com. And, of course, the Mac Gab Fest is almost as long running. I think maybe you are a little longer running than uh, Mac Break. Mac, we call it Mac Geek Gab, but you can call it Mac Gab Fest. <laughs> Whatever. <you want. laughs> Whatever. You know <laughs> what I meant. We've been called worse. That's right. <laughs> you know yep. what I meant. What's your pick yep. of the week, David? I, it was going to be the wise bulbs, but when Andy said default folder, my second pick was also from St. Clair Software, so I decided to go with that, which is App Tamer. 
it this app so if you're running one of the computers that was used in the moon landing some of the cpu <laughs> usage of apps that are out there might be a little much <laughs> but even if you're running one of these brand new 2019 iMacs sometimes like the spotlight index or md worker starts running roughshod yes. or backup yes. d right for time yes. machine starts running all over the place app tamer lets you pick which apps you want to throttle and only when they hit a certain percentage and, and of your CPU. Way, when Dave says throttle, he doesn't mean strangle, although you may want to strangle them. He's talking Correct. about slowing can, them down a little bit. You can actually completely <laughs> stop them, too. It's like this this will let you do all of that. That's it's 15 awesome. bucks. It's one of my favorite apps to use. I started using it because I had some older Macs that were running and then quickly realized, wait, I want this on my podcasting machine so that yes. like Spotlight. Oh, you, you know, know what? We got to get in. everybody uh, yeah. who uses Max to do Skype with us, Lori Gill. We got to get them all <laughs> to use this because that's a big problem. Right. We the other that's day we problem. had all these uh, lip sync issues with Scott Wilkinson, and a brilliant guy in our chat room said, "Oh, tell him to close Chrome," and it all right. got better. App yeah, Tamer because would it's have using all the that. CPU. It's using App Tamer would. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it really is. It's one of those things because like Spotlight will kick in when you're not using your mouse or your keyboard. Well, talking also uses my computer. And right. it was like, no, I want to like I, I need to stop it. And so App Tamer does that. <laughs> it, and it it's awesome. Really works well. Yeah. Wow. So, there you go. Fifteen bucks from it's St. Clair Software. Same guy. Podcaster's yeah. best friend. When did you start? The Geek Fest. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Geek Fest started on June 13th, 2005. Okay, so you might actually predate Mac Break Weekly. I think you do. The Mac yeah, Geek Not Gab by much. Moon landing. Yeah, the Moon Landing. And no, the Moon Landing. Yeah. yeah, that's right. The Mac yeah, that's right. Geek yeah. Gab podcast. You're up to episode 770. So this is, we're only at 723. We're just a child. Just a child right. compared to you. <laughs> Well, and then I look at like Adam Christensen with MacCast, and I feel like I've just begun. You know, yeah. it's like ah, dang. Davis, Brian Ibbett with Coverville. I don't know how you stay so young looking uh, after 15 years in podcasting. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the drums, man. <laughs> That's how I do it. <laughs> I am thrilled that you were here. Thank you for joining us. Come back again soon, okay? Thanks for having me. I would love to come back. Good. Thanks so much. Deal. Yeah. It's a deal. MacObserver.com, and of course the great Lori Gill. What's your pick of the week this week, Lori? This week, I'm going with a movie that I watched recently. I think it it only came out about a week or week and a half ago, and it's called Midsummer. Um, it is by the uh, same guy that directed Hereditary, Ari Aster. And Midsummer, like Hereditary, is pretty intense. It's uh, unusual. Um, this is a sort of the opposite version of dark. It's actually quite bright <laughs> in the way it's... Um, is presented to us, but it tells the same unusual, weird story. And uh, if you if you ever saw Wicker Man, oh um, yeah, it's it's nothing like it, but oh. also a <laughs> lot like it all at the same time. It, it, you can tell that he loved that movie, that he oh, he you know he cared about the the weird story being told in that movie. You can see so many sort of parallels in the way this story is presented, and even at some points, like completely the opposite of parallels actually it seems intentional so um if you liked hereditary this is definitely different because it, it instead of being really dark and telling this creepy story this is a really light version of a creepy story so um you know everything's bright and whitewashed you can see in this in this example here they're always in the sunshine and everyone wears white oh, so it, it kind it's of been summer right yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the story, you know, of the same same type of story that's told in Wicker Man of this sort of like um, group of people that celebrates, um, you know, like the changing of the seasons. And you know, I don't want to go into too many details, but but you know, weird things ensue. <laughs> uh, it's from A twenty four Films. Mm -hmm. Can you watch it online? No, you ha do you go to the movies? Uh, yeah. Where do you? Yeah. Yeah. It's st it's still in theaters. Um so it'll it'll probably pop up on your streaming services in in the next week or two. So if you don't if you don't go to the theater to see it, which I recommend you do. It's actually really nice to see a movie like, like that on the big screen. Um you, it will appear on on the iTunes and probably a couple other streaming services um at at some point soon. It so. seems so Shutter scan TV by the way. Seems yeah, it'll probably be on Shutter TV. Shutter. Yeah. Seems so Scandinavian. 
But it's yeah, not, um, right? Oh, I, I can't remember what they they are in. Uh, this is New York, <laughs> upstate. Uh, no, no, they're in. Well, oh, yo, oh, they're in the Sweden. They are. They're in a remote in. Swedish village. They're, they're from New York, but yeah. they're in a remote Swedish village. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Midsommar. You have the strangest yeah. taste. <laughs> <laughs> I like horror films. Yeah. Is this a horror <laughs> film or just a? It 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 is. It there's, is. Yeah. There's. Yes, it's one of those, uh, I think I hear people call them a uh, uh, smart horror, which is to me a silly term, but it's like that kind of movie, like The Witch. And actually, A24 makes a lot of films like that. I loved that. The Witch. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So good. it's kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Lori. Lori is a managing editor at iMore, iMore.com. She appears, as you heard, on many of the iMore podcasts uh, and, of course, on this show every week. We love having you on. Thank you, Lori. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you all for being here. We do Mac Break Weekly every Tuesday. We usually try to get in uh, about 11 a.m. unless Leo's running late, which he was today. I apologize. That's 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1700 UTC. You can join us uh, on the live stream if you want to watch or listen as we do the show. You can watch it being made at twit.tv slash live. If you're doing that, go in the chat room because that's where everybody else is who's hanging out watching live irc.twit.tv yes you can use an irc client but you can also use your web browser irc.twit.tv if you want to be in studio we had a great studio audience visiting us from uh, germany uh, this week also from modesto california and salt lake city and we had a lot of people in here in atlanta georgia thank you uh, to everybody coming by all you have to do is email tickets at twit.tv we'll put a chair out for you uh, you can also download copies of everything we do because that's what it means to be a podcast, as Dave well knows. Just go to twit.tv. For this show, it's twit.tv slash iOS. Twit.tv slash iOS. No. No. Nope. nope. It's twit.tv slash MBW. It's the Geek Gab Fest podcast. It's twit.tv. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, maybe 15 years in podcasting is too long, Dave Hamilton. <laughs> Twit. It might be. <laughs> it might be. Twit.tv slash MBW stands for Mac Break Weekly. But you know, you can avoid this entire confusion <coughs> if you just fire up your podcast app and subscribe. Then as you and I get a little more doddering in our, in our old age, <laughs> the show will still arrive on our phone ready to listen to the minute it's available. Thank you so much for being here but it's now i'm sorry to say time to get back to work because break time is over i remember that much bye-bye <laughs>